To find your seats this morning, let's sing that song, I Will Enter His Gates. And I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. Thank you for coming out to Sunday School this morning. We're going to continue our series with Pastor Greg on the church, God's Blueprint. There's Sunday School for all ages, also Spanish-speaking Sunday School as well. And we'll open in prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you're going to do this morning. We ask that you would open our hearts for what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, if you have your Bibles. You can turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to continue on in our series uh, on the church. And uh, we're talking about God's blueprint. And the Bible gives a clear blueprint of what the church should be. We've been going through numbers of word pictures that reveal to us what God intends the church to be. We have uh, three more lessons after today. There will be a total of... 12. Let's get our main verse, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, we always start with this verse because that the, uh, the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We'll do a whole lesson on that idea, but it, everything that God does in the earth comes through the church, and so... That is why we're using that. But today's verse, we're going to look at the church as the body of Christ. And so let's read uh, today's verse, Romans 12, 3 through 5. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Okay, so both of those verses repeat this idea, the body, the body of Christ. That's what we're going to look at today. Let's begin, let's uh, begin by looking at the work of the body. God's plan for the world, when he wanted to touch the world, and touch people, his plan was incarnation. It was literally a body. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Okay, so here is, uh, this is a prophetic and uh, Old Testament looking at, G at Jesus Christ. And says that God's plan was a body, a body prepared. So a principle wasn't enough. Just to tell people to send a letter, uh, to even have someone go tell them principles was not going to be enough. A letter is not going to be enough. A user's manual would not be enough. That verse says God's plan is there had to be a body, this is the, the Bible doctrine of what we call the incarnation. You normally hear that at uh, Christmas. That's when we look at the incarnation, which is God came down in a human body. Incarnation literally means enfleshment. So that is God's plan. So the purpose of Jesus having a body was to show God to people. John 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, the word, this is uh, literally the intention, the idea of God. It is a, 
uh, applied to God himself. And it said that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What is the result of Jesus coming down and dwelling among people? Is John said, we beheld his glory. We could see God. That glory is a shining. It is a reputation of God, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this was God's plan in having a body. People could see God, and God would be uh, revealed. So how did Jesus show God to people? Number one, in his body, Jesus spoke God's will to people. He declared what he wanted them to know. Mark 1, verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Okay, this is uh, the gospel. It was good news of what has already happened. In other words, an example would be if, if your nation went to war and you won, you would send heralds, literally evangelists, that's where we get the word evangel uh, evangelist from, and they will tell the good news. So Jesus comes preaching the kingdom of God. He is literally telling them, I want you to know something about God. So God is revealed by Jesus speaking God's will to people. Number two, in his body, Jesus cared for people. Uh, he helped people in very practical ways. John 6, verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Okay, so people have practical needs. It's not just simply come and... Uh, attend and I'm going to teach you some godly principles. In this case, they had literal needs. They needed to eat and so uh, Jesus fed because in his body he helped people in practical ways. We're going to apply this to us uh, a little bit later. The third thing, in his body Jesus defeated the enemy. 1 John 3 verse 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay, the works of the devil in any form, whether that is addiction, sin, sickness, in any way, Jesus came to destroy, the word literally means to undo, to untie the works of the devil. So Jesus shows God by telling about God, by showing God in practical help, <laughs> excuse me, and thirdly, by defeating the enemy. That is the purpose of Jesus having a physical body on the earth. But now, Jesus is not on the earth in a physical body. So now, how is God's will going to be carried out on earth? There is a, a Bible doctrine that we... Uh, understand and that is sovereignty. God is in charge. He is sovereign. He rules at all times. But some Christians take that idea that God is in charge to an extreme that it is uh, uh, not meant to be. How they interpret sovereignty is it's all up to God. If God wants to do anything on earth, he will do it. We don't have to do anything. William Carey, you know, he was a, a famous uh, missionary at a heart for missions before he originally went overseas. He was a, a cobbler. He worked on shoes. But he had a heart for missions, and so he would meet with groups of people trying to stir them to give and to send missionaries. In one of these meetings where... William Carey is speaking passionately about that we need to reach the lost. An older uh, a Christian, older pastor rebuked William Carey and he said, young man, sit down. 
You are an enthusiast, which back then, that was, he's saying, you're a fanatic. And listen to what he said. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your help or mine. Okay, why is he saying that? Because God is sovereign. Everything is up to God. Anything that God wants done, he will do it. But that is not correct. That is why so much of God's work does not get done. That is why 2,000 years after God giving us through Jesus Christ simple marching instructions to go into all the world, the world is still not one. And the reason why is there are people who don't understand this idea of the body of Christ. Okay, now we get into our uh, text. Our text says plainly, the church, the, all of these different imageries that we've been looking at, they reveal different aspects. What is a local church? What is the church in Prescott, Arizona supposed to be? And our text says the church is the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, the church is his body. All of the things that we said why Jesus had to have a physical body, they now apply to the church. The church is now his body. Okay, think about some of these things. The church, as the body of Christ, is the visible representation of God in the world. In the same way, John 1, 14, they said, we beheld the glory. The word was made flesh. We could see something of God in Jesus Christ. But now, the church is the body. That means that people should be able to see something of God when they come into our church. When I was in uh, uh, South Africa last week for the conference, uh, a young man came. He's a, a new convert. You understand in the, in the history of racism in South Africa, very hard racial lines. African are full black colored. That's mixed race, Indian and whites. And so a new convert came in. Now he is African. He is full black so in his experience, when you get around other races, it doesn't go well. Other races, they don't treat each other well. So now he comes, someone witnessed him, he came and got saved, but he said when he came into church, he saw white people and colored people. And he said that made him very nervous because he's wondering how are these people gonna treat me? They're not my race, how are they gonna treat me? And he, and he told Pastor Heimberg, uh, he said, but after watching, he just came and just watched people. He said, I can see everybody loves everybody here. That's a very, that's a very powerful uh, uh, representation of God. That's a good thing. It would have been bad if he came in and people treated him badly. You're not our kind, right? So the church is now the visible representation uh, of God in the world. Our text says the church is the body of Christ. The body, the job of any body is to carry out the will of the head, right? If I want to take a drink, my head says, hand, pick this up, unscrew the cap, right? That's, that's the job of the body is to do the will of the head. The church is his body. The head of the church is not Pastor Greg. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. Our job is to carry out the will of the head, which is Christ. So what that means, if the church is the body of Christ, God carries out his will through people. John 20, 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Okay, this is, uh, the timing of this verse is very important. Jesus is now risen from the dead in just a few short 
days he will leave the earth, but now he gives, those are marching orders. As the Father sent me, Jesus constantly was on earth, I am here to do the will of my Father. He said, as my Father sent me, now I am sending you. So God's will is accomplished through the body uh, of Christ, or literally, God carries out his will. It is an extreme, that's actually false doctrine if we say God does it all. If God wants to save people, he will save them. No, God works through people because people in a local church were the body of Christ. Okay, all the things that we said about Jesus Christ now apply to us. How do we function as the body of Christ? We are to speak God's will to people. Matthew 10, verse 7. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, now remember, I, we, I emphasized before, Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So now he sends his disciples and he says, you go and preach and say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. People learn about God through other people. How many of you here, before you got saved, you were not a churchgoer and you didn't know much about God at all? Anybody here? You didn't know much about God. So how did you first learn about God? Did you just study intently and go on a long quest? Probably not. How many of you here, you first heard about God's will, about salvation from another person? Okay, because God carries out his will. We speak for God. That's what evangelism is. When you witness, when we street preach, when we hold outreaches, we are telling people something about God. And, and in many cases, they know nothing about God until a human being tells them. Second thing, just like Jesus Christ when he was on earth, he helped people, he met practical needs. If we are the body of Christ, we need to meet practical needs of other people. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Okay, to stir up love and good works. Good works is not going downtown and helping little old ladies cross the street. I'm sure that would be helpful. The context is in the church. If we are the body of Christ, there are practical needs here. I often challenge disciples. I challenge you this morning, when church is going on, I want you to look around and ask, who's not here today? Do you even, does it even enter your head? There will be people who are not here. Some of them may be sick, but there will be people that they are, the devil's messing with their head. I, I don't think I can even go on. Why, why keep going? They're, maybe they're struggling with uh, uh, grief or various problems. So if they're going to have practical needs met, and then, of course, there's, there can be financial needs and practical help in, in different ways, it's people. That's the job of the church. We don't just come and uh, attend. That's actually what's wrong with, in a megachurch model of people who have actually no relationship with anybody in church. That's, that's unbiblical. Because if you have no, if all you do is come in at the last minute, you get to worship for a while, hear a nice sermon, and then you leave and you have nothing to do with anybody, how are you possibly going to meet anybody else's needs if you don't even know them? Right? So the, the church, we care for people by meeting practical needs. And thirdly, just like Jesus and his body, we now help enforce Jesus' victory. Remember, he came to destroy the works of the devil, but now he wants us to enforce that victory in various ways. Matthew 6, 9 and 10. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, how, according to that verse, Frank, how is God's will going to be done on earth? What does it say? As it is in heaven. No, what are we supposed to do to bring that? Pray. 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 That's right. Every believer, if you pray, you are bringing uh, uh, heaven down. That's what happens in the, in the salvation uh, of a loved one. And my, my wife uh, had numbers of members of her family that got gloriously saved after years of not being saved because we prayed. My sister got saved because we prayed. What you're literally doing is you're praying heaven down. You're, you're, you're fighting. Some of you have loved ones. You gotta, you gotta fight hell off them. Jesus defeated hell. We now can pray hell off of people so that they can make a good decision. That would be just one aspect. Maybe that is in, um, uh, like I said, if there's people that are missing, that are hurting in various ways, you can pray and ask God to meet with them and ask God to encourage them. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, this is one of the powers of prayer. You, prayer has uh, uh, two aspects. One is you can bind that literally to tie up or you're saying no. There are things in people's lives that you can pray and you can say, no, devil, I'm not gonna let that happen. You can stop it. And then on the other hand, you can loose, you can release, you can release encouragement, you can release uh, right thinking or peace or whatever it is that, that people need. That happens through people. God does not simply just float around the earth, there's a problem, I need to fix it. The church is the body of Christ and we help enforce the victory. Matthew 10, verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Okay, every time you pray for the sick and they get healed, Matthew 10, they have an outreach later on and Jesus said, I saw Satan fall. Satan lost ground today because of an outreach and, and they prayed for the sick or, or casting out demons. That's... That's our job. You have power over uh, hell. Years ago, one of the concert directors came and said that a lady called and wants us to come cast a demon out of her husband. And I said, where does she go to church? And I said, it goes to the assembly of God. And I said, get the assembly of God to cast the demon out. And she says, no, there's nobody at the assembly of God who knows how to cast out a demon. So I said, all right, get a van, take some boys, go cast it out of him. So I think Stephen Cassio, I don't remember who all was uh, there in there, but uh, sure enough, they got to cast out a real life demon uh, out of a man. They were enforcing the victory of the cross, and so that happens. God's will comes through people. That's the first thought of the body of Christ. Let's get into our second point, and then we'll open for some questions. The second idea, if the church is the body of Christ, let's talk about the unity of the body. Very important uh, requirement of a healthy body is unity. It is not helpful when parts of the body don't work together. Any of you that struggle with diabetes is your pancreas is not working with the rest of the body like it should. It is not producing the insulin that it should, an autoimmune disease of various kinds. There are many of them. The body is attacking itself. That's not helpful. That produces pain, swelling, uh, various kinds of problems. So you don't want your body to fight itself. What we want is we want unity. We want all the parts of the body working together. That is also true of the body of Christ. 
the body of Christ is only going to work when there is unity. So, but think about this. There are people missing from the body of Christ. In any church service, there are people who should be here, but they're not. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Okay, the body of Christ, if you're not a part of the body, if you don't come to church, the, the Bible says with the day approach, these, are, these days are getting weirder and weirder, right? Demons from hell are, are ruling in many different ways. So you are at risk, that's what that text says. But on the other hand, a lot of people, they look at it like, yeah, I, I don't feel like going. But imagine if my hand just said today, nah, I don't feel like going to church today. Right? You supply something. And so one of the problems you have is people who are missing from the body of Christ. That doesn't work well. There are people who are in conflict with others in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Okay, this is written to a local church. Now, I know this would never happen here under our superior ministry, but he says it's possible that there are people in the same church who have bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, that's fighting, and evil speaking. Is that possible that there is any of that here? Surely not. But that's, that's true. So when the body is fighting with itself, it's the same. It's a, there are spiritual autoimmune diseases in the body of Christ. People are fighting. Well, they, they hurt me. They offended me. So what? There's a bigger picture in life. So the truth of the body is this. You need other people, and other people need you. Romans 12 Verse four and five. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Okay, the body is made up of different parts. And when you put them together, they work well. Your eyeball would not function outside the body very well. This is not gonna work, right? It needs... The body, your body needs your eye. Your eye needs the body. Okay, the problem is we have, in modern Christianity, we have Christians who never attach themselves to a body of Christ. They don't ever say, this is where I am going to be a part of the body of Christ. There are people that say, I, I move from church to church. Aren't you glad that your kidney doesn't float from body to body? You know, yesterday my kidney was a Mitchell, and then I say, ah, I'm tired of Mitchell. I think I want to be in a Jones body today or a Smith body. No, you want your body together. You need other people. Other people need you. So that means then, if the church is the body of Christ, that is a responsibility. We, we, we get calls from people, they want to know about the programs of the church. They want to know, what do you do for children, seniors, left-handed Latvian people, you know, what, what, on and on and on. What do, you, what do you do? Do you have a specific program? They're shopping, and they're going to make a choice based on what the church can do for them. But the body of Christ means you should supply something. You don't just take something, you supply something that other people need. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined in it together by what every joint supplies, 
according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Okay, so now the Bible says when there is a healthy body, the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint or every part supplies, it causes an effective working. We had, uh, earlier in the summer, we had the Olympics. These are uh, athletes that are at the top of their game. There's, there's something about an athlete that their body is fine-tuned, whether that is gymnastics or rowing or different things. When that, they are operating at peak capacity because every part of the body works effectively. Okay, now, the problem is when you're a part of the body of Christ and you view yourself incorrectly, and that also causes us to view uh, other people incorrectly. Now, this comes back to our main verse, Romans 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Okay, here is the, again, he's writing to believers in a local church, and he says, the problem is when people think of themselves more highly than they ought to think. In other words, they look at their part in the body of Christ, and, and there are people, they assume my part is important, your part is unimportant. How many people right now have a microphone? Only one. So clearly, I am special. <laughs> that, that would be foolish. That is not true to, to say, are you on the stage? Are you in public? Do people clap for you after you sing or after you uh, uh, act or, or whatever it might be? Then clearly your, your part is unimportant, unimportant. Your part is behind the scenes. Your part is, is uh, uh, serving in the kitchen. Your, your part is in the parking lot or security. That, that's foolishness to think that our part is better so we look down on people but on the other hand so there are a few people that that's their problem they're thinking too much of themselves but on the other hand there are people who think too little of themselves right my part is unimportant because I'm not in public because I'm not on stage what difference does it make if I'm here or not and there, this is how people think. Is, is the church going to stop? If I don't come to church today, is the whole church going to stop? No, because I'm not preaching. I'm not playing music. I'm not on, on stage. Romans 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Okay, a measure of faith. This came out, I think it was Matt Sanderlin in one of our morning sessions. He wanted to know how much was a measure of faith. And, he, you know, we studied that to see is that an amount. But then I got to the heart of the issue. I said, the real issue is faith for what? Context is everything. Faith for what? The context is your part in the body of Christ, you need faith. It matters if I come to church. That's what God says. It matters if I pray, whether that's in the mornings or before uh, uh, the evening services. It matters if I give. It matters if I worship. You need to have faith because that's what God says the church is the body of Christ. Okay, let's open for some uh, questions or comments. Something you want to ask or something you want to add. Now's your chance. Jeff Brown, up here, brother. Turn around, there you go. Right there, there you go. Jeff, raise your hand, there you go, thanks. Lord, I, 
When I look at what the devil puts out, it's always, you know, their gods are some giant naked Greek guy, you know, or, or some demonic looking big giant thing with horns and stuff. And God picks out a body. I mean, he picks out Jesus Christ who wasn't even handsome. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, you know, I think he just really is looking for love. Yes. And, you know, that's why he takes a bunch of nose pickers like us. And, <laughs> that's you know, if right. We love each other. It's part of the plan. Yes. Abraham Lincoln said God must love ordinary people because he made so many of them. <laughs> Good. Somebody else? Something you want to ask? Something you want to add? Betty? When we came, we were in our 30s. We had children. We were unsaved. Bill, I, but I had gotten saved just prior to that. Bill went down to the park because he was lonely. We were in Tempe. Sell, I was selling a house. He came up here and, and just, he, so he, go, he heard music. And he went down to the park. And here, right behind Bucky O'Neill, all this going on, but the thing that, in, that he called me about, he said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like church. I don't like, uh, he, he said he'd never go to church. We've had a bad experience and we'll never go. But he said there were young men with babies on the, in their arms passing out flyers and talking to people about Jesus. There's something different about them. He called me to tell me that, the man that said, I will never. So out of that experience and a few other things that God orchestrated, we got saved. So we've been saved now from the time we were, thir uh, were 30. We are now 80. Yes. Now we're looking back. Yeah. It's worth everything. There have been problems. There have been hurts. There have been times we wondered if we were, you know, doing the right thing because parents didn't want us to do it. Looking back, we have been blessed, and heaven is going to be our home. Amen. And it is the greatest thing. All the problems have disappeared into the past. Amen. Now we see Jesus. Very good. And Betty, you, you often told me when you called uh, uh, Pastor Mitchell for the first time, it was, it was very practical. What was it? It was to unload the moving van, right? Yeah. Yes. Is that, is that what happened? Yes. And, and how was it that you called? When we called to the moving, we were moving, and I was pregnant, much to my amazement, and I blamed Bill for the whole thing. I wasn't there, and I was mad. So, I'm very strong. I'm able to help move things, but now I can't. So, we had to have someone come and help us move. So, he called several churches. First, he called out of the newspaper. People, no, no, they didn't, that, they didn't do that kind of work. So he called some different churches. Every single church he called, what was it, three or four? Several. Yeah, four or five. From the office that he was going to be in on a Saturday, he called and said, um, where's, where can we get help to move? Uh, we just, we'll pay somebody. And they said, every single one said, well, we don't have young people, but you know that four square church in town, they, there's a lot of young people there. Yeah. Yeah. Four or five churches told Bill that. Finally, but we'd been told in town how horrible the church was. No love. Pastor Mitchell was mean. That, I'm, uh, that they, you know, they locked you in. That they sacrificed your children. I mean, we heard it. I heard it all in a laundromat. So I was afraid to go. But Bill called. Sister Mitchell answered. I love this. Hello? It's like, okay. He said, I, uh, they say you have gr uh, children or young people there. I need someone to help me move. Is there someone that would do that? She said, yes, meet us at the church in 30 minutes, I think it was. He said, we didn't know if we were getting 14, 95, mean. Oh, we didn't know. So we go to the church and Bear Clow, Dave Bear Clow calls, calls out of the, of the car and when he gets, he, he was so good to our children, he worked like a dog. He was so good to our children, they still call him our Dave to this day, our adult mm -hmm. children. So he began to just love them and talk to them. And, we, and then Bill said, 
um, is there some time you need to be home, uh, you know, be back to town? And he, it was on a Wednesday. Well, it was amazing to us. And he said, yes, I'm going to church to Jubilee service tonight, and I need to be back for church. And we're like, what? And he witnessed to us in the kindest way at the table. We fed him. Uh, I always feed everybody that comes, and he, he just, he began to pour out. He came, he got saved, and it made such an impression on us. Yes, excellent. That then Bill said, you wanted to go to church. I said, yes, where shall we go today? Because he said, he promised me he would go to a church. And he said, four square. Or he said, yeah, we're going to the four square. I said, no, they'll take my children, no. <laughs> he said, you can't fool all of the policemen in town because we'd heard you pass drugs in the <laughs> offering plate. I mean, we had heard weird things. And so I'd, I'd already been in churches that fought all the time. So I said, no, I don't, I'm not going there. He said, well, then we're not going. All right, so I came, I was absolutely terrified. Yes, they did take my children. Somebody met us at the door and whisked those kids off. And I'm like, oh God, which one are they going to sacrifice? So. <laughs> <laughs> but the people were absolutely the most gracious. There were young people that loved us even though we were older. We were, Bob and Sharon Allen were older. We were older, I, you know, and, yeah. but they were so wonderful. And it was so different. When we got Very out good. of the first service, Bill said, that man preached the truth, didn't he? Yeah. Took him a while to get saved because he knew he had to change. But yeah. Bill got saved, delivered from cigarettes on the top of the mountain, alcohol gone, and a temper that almost destroyed us. And I'd hear him in the bedroom praying and asking God to forgive him. Then he'd come and ask me to forgive him, and I would say, well, I've heard that before. We'll see. You know, it's the same one that was mad when I was pregnant. So, sure enough, God has done it. Oh, how Praise could we God. ever leave this body? Thank God. That is wonderful. Thank you. Okay, let's look at the final thought. Let's talk about the diversity of the body. So the body carries out the will of the head. Number two, there is unity in the body. It must be. The third idea of the church is, as the body of Christ, is that in a healthy body, there is diversity. The body is made up of very different parts. Your eye is nothing like your hand. Your ear is nothing like your knee. But put them together, then they can accomplish great things. So the church is made up of very different people. There are people here, if it wasn't for the church, you would never be with people like we have here. And they wouldn't have anything to do with you different, but you put them together. Okay, the body of Christ shows us that we have different functions. Romans 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. Okay, so we have many members in the body. All the members do not have the same function. Aren't you glad? I am so glad when I met my wife, she was not just one big eyeball. <laughs> right? There were different, uh, different parts. And uh, that is true. In a church, you have people who do uh, public ministry versus behind the scene. There are people who do things before the service. They, some do things during the service. Different parts. Romans 12, verse 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Okay, so here he's just giving just a, a shotgunning of various different ministries. That's the idea in the body of Christ. We do not all do the same thing. We don't have the same function. But when you put all the functions together, it's very good. It, it's, uh, some of you here, you have bad knees, bad hips, 
bad eyes, bad ears. And one bad part can affect the other, right? When one part is not doing what it should, it affects everything. That's true in the body of Christ. When there are people who should be playing a part and they don't, it affects the whole body of Christ. So you have people who fail to play their part. They could play a part, but they don't. Colossians 4, 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Okay, this man Archippus, we don't know what his role and function was, but he was supposed to be doing something in the body of Christ, and Paul has to write, and he says, say to Archippus, you received a ministry from the Lord, fulfill it. Do what God wants you to do. That may be a specific calling. That may be a talent that you have. You should do what God wants you to do. Let me ask you a question. Are you currently robbing the body of Christ of your contribution? Is it possible that there's something God wants you to do in the body of Christ and you're not doing it? And you look at it like this, ah, I just don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. I, I'm, I'm tired or that guy bugs me or whatever. But by doing that, you are robbing the body of Christ of your part, your contribution. So that's, that's one problem. People who don't do what they're supposed to do. They don't play their part. Another problem is when you have people who are unhappy with their part and they want somebody else's part. There, there are people, I, I want to preach if you're not called, you shouldn't. It's a calling issue. But I, I, sometimes that's out of insecurity, rejection issues. They think if they have a title or if they get a microphone that that will give them worth. That's not true. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with the endurance the race that is set before us. Okay, run with endurance the race that is set before us. That would be, both of these are running uh, imageries. You have two ideas that can either be uh, your lane on a track, run in your lane, that's where you're supposed to run, or it can be, Cross country, there is uh, a course that is marked out. You stay in your course. God may have a calling for you, a particular purpose that He wants you uh, to fulfill. And uh, He says, You need to run your race. Don't run somebody else's race, run your race. Finally, when all the parts of the body work together, and play their part, it, it is something powerful. Colossians 2, verse 19. And not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Okay, grows with the increase that is from God. This is uh, something that is practical. If, there, if there's gonna be growth, you have to have more people involved. Pastor Metro used to say, used to teach us that an exceptional man, and there's not many of those, an exceptional man can build a church to 70 people doing everything himself, 60 or 70 doing everything himself, but if he wants to grow beyond that, you have to have other people playing a part, and when other people play the part, the Bible says growth can be the result in Ephesians 4.12, final verse. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay, for the work of the ministry, the saints do the work. God's will comes through people, and the edifying, the body of Christ is built up when people play their part. Okay, do we have any final uh, questions or comments? Something you want to ask or something you want to add? Now's your chance. Somebody back there? Who's that, Pete? 
there were numerous scriptures that you had mentioned that uh, edify and love, speak truth and love, um, exhort uh, unto love and good works. And um, when Jeff testified, he mentioned love. And, uh, the, it was the love of the people in the church that um, helped Betty and, and Bill. And I wonder sometimes if love isn't the actual life's blood that has to, in order for us to be unified, there has to be that element, and God commands us. It's even greater than faith. And I just, um, I'm constantly in my own heart wrestling with that because I, do, I don't have that naturally, but yet um, I just wonder what you think about that as far as it being the actual life's blood of the church that's yeah. going to make, because the Bible even says that the world will know us by our love for each other. It'll, yes. it'll actually be the evidence yes. of, uh, to the world that because we love each other and without that, without that, there's no unity. And so that was just yes. my, my thought. Well, love is powerful. Love is a command, which means it can be done. God says, love one another. There are cranky people like, no, I don't want to. But it's a command. You have to overcome your natural uh, cranky tendencies, right? Love. Very good, Pete. Somebody else. Something you want to ask. Something you want to add. Anything else? Okay, we'll stop there, and the service will begin at 1030. God bless you.